there's no doubt we're in the midst of an ecological and climate crisis. And to avert it in any meaningful way, we need radical action and we need it now. In this programme, we see how the maritime industry, a sector upon which the global economy is built, is reimagining tomorrow. Harnessing technology and innovation, breaking down barriers and pushing boundaries to build a more sustainable, greener future that will benefit us all. I'm Rob Bell. I'm here at Portico, the cargo terminal in Portsmouth. Welcome to Making Waves, the future of shipping. The whole decarbonisation process is the biggest challenge that humanity has ever faced. We've spent the last 2,000 years squabbling with each other for economic advantage. We've now got to work together, probably to our economic disadvantage, to save the planet. Eventually we do need to make the jump because otherwise we'll be stuck in today's system and today's fuels. This is a transition that needs to happen in a relatively short time. In order to make the difference in the future, it's essential that we act today. Leading the call to action for net zero shipping is EPSRC, the UK's Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Part of UK research and innovation, their funding not only backs solutions, but also highlights the problems. The task ahead does seem rather daunting. With around 61,000 vessels in the global trade fleet, only around 400 are actually using alternative fuels. The UK has good positions in all of the different technologies. The challenge is really in around joining the dots and starting to have some really large scale programs. For the past decade, shipping's been on a transformative journey towards becoming greener and cleaner. And it's work that's starting to bear fruit. Ask the team at Portsmouth International Port and they'll tell you it's a living laboratory for green technology. They're intent on becoming the UK's first net zero carbon port by 2030. But it's out at sea and on the ships that transport 90% of the world's food, products and fuel where perhaps shipping's greatest challenge still lies. Because how we fuel ships today and into the future will largely dictate how green this sector can become. The Sustainable Shipping Initiative is looking at the decarbonisation of the shipping sector through the um, life cycle impacts of the different potential low to zero carbon fuels from a sustainability perspective. Our vision helps put the spotlight on those issues that need to be addressed. Our focus in SSI is if we're to be sustainable, we have to consider all aspects in the life cycle. It's about the economic, uh, social and governance issues as well. Make sure that when you're choosing the alternative fuels and technologies to, to solve your onboard emissions problem, that you're not causing problems elsewhere and you're not resulting in upstream emissions that could even be higher than the onboard emissions that you're trying to solve. We have got to put resources and momentum and collaboration into moving the industry towards net zero. At Vartsala's sprawling corporate campus in Finland, world-leading research is being carried out which aims to revolutionise shipping. They've been testing the fuels of the future, fuels that will be carbon-free. In June, we ran tests the first of their kind in history on this scale. With this engine, a mixture of ammonia, 70% with MDO, and in the test cell next room, an engine with pure hydrogen. We at Wärtsilä are putting a lot of RD efforts in developing both engines and systems that are intended for the carbon-free fuels as well as upgrades and retrofits for existing equipment. To succeed with the transition to greener fuels, collaboration between private innovators and the political community is essential. As an industry, we really need to come together as an ecosystem because nobody can make this transition alone. Collaboration is really important because it gives an opportunity to decarbonize shipping 
So shipping fuel is a uh, huge volume, it's about 200 million tonnes a year, and there's no way that there's enough, for instance, used cooking oil to address that kind of volume, and there never will be. But glycerin does offer an opportunity to scale something up that can actually supplant and replace fossil fuels in shipping. We're taking glycerin, which is not being utilised by anyone else in the sector, to offer a new biofuel, BioMSAR, which offers a 20 to 30% reduction in CO2 emissions. I'm very proud of the work that we're doing here. I think it could really have a, a big impact in making the world a more carbon neutral place. So what we're looking to do is replace the main generator with stored energy, so that's batteries. On board, while the ship's engine runs on diesel, the hotel power, the lights and power sockets run on batteries. So this is the main engine behind you and the main generator, and this is the control panel where it all comes together. It's not an option for the Scotline fleet to plug into shore power yet because it simply isn't available in most ports. The battery project has been enabled by Maritime Research and Innovation UK, known as MARI UK, which brings together academics with industry and government money. We've actually been working on behalf of the UK government's Department for Transport, um, managing research spend. The UK has an immensely strong research base, largely held in universities. So to make progress on this complicated systems problem, we need to draw on that. And that involves universities working closely with industry. There absolutely has to be a sense of urgency. Uh, every year that passes without making progress on decarbonisation across society, but in this case in shipping, is an opportunity lost and it contributes to global warming. And if we don't start now, will not get there. The ships that are built in 2030 will still be on the water in 2050. So there's no time to waste. We've got to move now. We're probably a little bit late, to be honest. Let's go 20 minutes per second, please. Today, a 1 20th scale model of the windship system's wings is being put through its paces. Painstaking testing like this along with computational fluid dynamic modelling, have given the team confidence that this is a zero carbon propulsion system for some of the ocean's largest and thirstiest vessels. In spite of the name, the Windship propulsion system only begins with aerodynamics. The innovative drive train system also uses an electric generator that kicks in when needed. The exhaust gases from the generator are cleaned in a carbonator and the heat from this reaction and the natural temperature of the exhaust gas is used to power a steam turbine, which in turn generates more electrical energy. All this energy is fed into the electric motor, driving the propeller in harmony with the thrust from the rigs. And all that is emitted from the exhaust is clean white vapour. Collaboration, working in partnership with ship owners, is proving vital to the development and deployment of smart technologies. It's an approach taken by Lean Marine, with AI-powered semi-autonomous systems for improving energy efficiency at sea, whilst optimising propulsive power. Here's the fuel consumption per nautical mile. This vessel is one of the first ones that will receive this artificial intelligence support tool because UECC being a very collaborative customer, uh, we, we need to collaborate with our customers in order to achieve all the best results. And it's also a vessel that has been very responsive in using the tool in the right way. So we're very confident that they will also be able to adopt the artificial intelligence, moving our knowledge even into their planning phase. Artificial intelligence will help us analyze all the data you collect to be able to decide before something happens how external factors will affect it. So it will really help us to become more efficient, it will help us to look to the future and see how our actions actually take effect and it will help us reduce emissions even further. Green shipping is one of our overarching themes here at Newcastle University and it underpins everything that we do in research and development, particularly working with industry to help them make the right choices. Monitoring is key as the industry strives towards zero carbon emissions, which is why the university is very proud to have developed Engine I. It is simplest, it's monitoring how much diesel is used and then you associate that with activities that the vessel is undertaking and that then tells you something about how well or otherwise you've used your energy. 
This is where the university's cavitation tunnel comes in, one of only two in the UK. This loop of water that we pump around is like a racetrack. We need to come up through the final bend. I think it's a hugely exciting time to be a naval architect because we're going to have to make a step change in our industry in the way that we deal with the climate crisis, the way that we deal with this transition to new energy, and also the way that we design ships and the propulsion packages that go with them. As we continue to push the boundaries, experimenting, testing and researching new ways of reducing shipping's carbon footprint, ensuring safety at sea will always remain paramount. Countdown starting now. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. We do the things that you, you don't want to happen on your actual facility, so uh, the explosions and the demonstrations that we do on, on, on the site uh, are centred around uh, making sure that they don't happen uh, in, in reality, if you like, away from uh, centres such as this where they can be conducted in a controlled manner. Safeguarding life, property and the environment has been the foundation of DMB's operations for 157 years. But it's supporting the industry and understanding which pathways towards decarbonisation are worth pursuing that's critical right now. More research needs to be done and to have a centre like SPEDAR and where we are able to do that research and transfer that research into the areas, for instance, classification or directly to our customers, to the ship owners, to support the entire shipping industry, it, it is fantastic. From the earliest ocean liners to the fastest sail ships the world has ever seen, the UK has an enviable tradition in cutting edge ship design. Boasting the world's most advanced full-motion maritime simulator, Artemis Technologies design, test and create the cutting-edge, emissions-free ships of the future. The boats that we developed for racing demonstrated staggering efficiency. Using the wind alone, we were able to travel at 50 miles an hour. And it really was that realisation that if craft can be made that efficient, why? Why are we burning so many fossil fuels in the maritime industry? In Belfast, the Maritime Consortium aims to create for the city an urban maritime transport system of the future. The Artemis e-foiler ferry is central to the city's plans. What we're attempting here is a world first, and that's, that's a huge challenge, but it's also a huge motivation to myself and, and to the rest of the team. We're almost reinventing the wheel. Our motivation was the climate challenge that faces us and the recognition that there was part we could have to play in that. Salonian 3 has served the islands well since its launch in 1977, but now its operators, the Isles of Scilly Steamship Group, are looking to the future. A brand new Salonian is planned along with a new cargo ship and inter-island ferry. They're the creation of design and engineering group BMT, the culmination of a long-standing relationship with the Isles of Scilly Steamship Group. Minimising its environmental impact is also crucial. The new ship will be a hybrid of combustion engine supported by an electric power management system. The main um, objective for this is to allow the vessel to operate uh, zero emission when it's uh, at harbour, so they can switch off all of their uh, combustion engines, and also to go in and out of harbour on electric only. So the vessel is also um, currently being designed in order to allow for that capacity to increase and, you know, perhaps potentially in the future to be fully zero emission. Windward is a global leader in maritime risk analytics. Properly harnessed, AI is the tool by which informed decisions and predictions about decarbonisation can be made. We're building a model to independently assess and measure carbon emissions from every vessel worldwide. And the fact of the matter is, that the same vessel doing a similar but not identical journey could have a quadruple amount of carbon emissions. And if you provide this to charters, to banks, to ship owners, and even to logistics providers on a daily basis without asking the owner for data all day, you can really make a difference in how they take decisions and actually reduce the carbon emissions on a day by day, week by week, quarter by quarter basis. Imagine being able to predict the future to take a ship not even built yet and stress test it across every conceivable scenario. This is uh, the future of how uh, engineering is going to be done. The, the uh, traditional review, traditional uh, calculations on spreadsheets, and, uh, it's not going to cut it for the new stuff that's coming up. 
At ABS's world headquarters just outside of Houston, Texas, Jan Chow works in this impressive high-tech design room where he leads a team that tests various decarbonization solutions virtually. We start with a baseline model of an existing vessel. What we do is we take the propulsion system specifically uh, and we build out a simulation model in a virtual environment. And by doing that, we're able to account for many different phenomena that are happening in the physical world, in the virtual world, um, and then we can make changes to it. 3D simulations will not only show new shipbuilders how to reduce the cost of future conversions set by regulators, but the technology also reveals how existing vessels can be converted. Captain, firstly, thank you so much for allowing me up here on the bridge. I mean, this is some privilege, I have to say. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the groundbreaking sustainable technology that you've got on board Victoria of White? Yes, yeah, certainly. So Victoria of White was designed uh, with a reduction in emissions in mind. Uh, it's a, very much at the heart of our green agenda. Um, so the company have invested £30 million in the building of Victoria of White. Uh, the technology itself comprises four diesel generators and two uh, battery banks. The idea behind it is that the uh, generators can be kept running at maximum load and any deficiencies are picked up by the batteries. This effectively enables us to run the ship using uh, less generators online at any one time uh, and, and that's where we get our fuel savings and hence emission savings. So when the ship's in port we are effectively on batteries alone mm. so the ship is silent and emissionless. Basically we got four main diesel generators and two battery packs feeding into an electrical switchboard and from the electrical switchboard we drive four electrical driven voice Schneider propellers. At the moment we've got two diesels running and we've got two battery packs on board so the diesels are supplementing the batteries to drive the ship. And what's it like for you to, to run and, and maintain this technology? It's very good actually, it's completely different from what we've seen before. My main background is mechanical engineering with an electrical degree. With a lot of this stuff, this is all computer based, so we need more electricians to look after the switchboards. So in the future, as the technology goes on, we're gonna need more electrical and more IT support. It feels to me like that's an extremely exciting prospect then for, for anybody looking to future careers, whether they know or not that they might be interested in engineering because of this exciting new technology that's coming into shipping. I got into this career at 16 myself, and I've never looked back, it's great. So for young people, it, it's good, it has opportunities. It good. is good. Good man. And mechanical engineer? Mechanical engineer. Nice one, put it there, Ryan. The innovation and technological advancements deployed in shipping's decarbonisation can only flourish if the conditions are right. The importance of regulations and market forces cannot be understated. Demand is growing from within the private sector for governments and policymakers to be more ambitious. There are two fundamental risks that every operator faces. One is technological uncertainty and the other is policy uncertainty. What we know is that those two things will clarify at some point in the next uh, decade and probably the next five years. As they clarify, those with the wrong business model will find some very significant risks of stranded assets. In the quest to incorporate zero carbon solutions sooner rather than later and to make the global shipping industry carbon neutral by 2050, Trafigura, one of the world's largest commodity trading groups, has emerged as one of the strongest advocates for change. It collaborates across industries to develop new fuel alternatives and is leading the call for the urgent introduction of a levy on carbon intensive maritime fuels. Trafigura was the first to call for a global IMO lead carbon levy on maritime fuels through a white paper published in 2020, which has since received substantial support. Since we launched our white paper for a global IMO lead carbon levy, we've seen a tremendous uh, mindset change. It doesn't mean we are at the finish line because we're definitely not. But we've seen people come on board. We've seen leading industry voices come and support a global carbon levy. Without regulation, forget about shipping decarbonisation. Simple as that. We see the change to zero carbon as the next big change in propulsion technology. And it's happening a lot, lot quicker than previous changes from sail to steam or steam to oil. We are determined to be at the forefront of that change by bringing together all the different interested parties, such as the government, the regulators, the insurance, the finance, the offshore wind farm operators, 
and the suppliers who are developing the technology, including the universities, to find the best solution for each individual field uh, going forward. Bibby Marine's service operation vessels provide temporary accommodation for wind farm workers in the middle of the ocean. But though they serve as the greenest of energy producers, like all ships, they're diesel fueled, emitting greenhouse gases. That's why the company's CEO is so ambitious to keep pressing ahead with its zero carbon vessel innovation project. Vessels built today are in the water for 30 years. Uh, we don't want to be waiting another 10, 20 years to build a zero carbon vessel. I think our timeline should be more in the region of five to ten years, which sounds like an awful long way away, but during the life of a vessel, that's relatively quick. So with the help of government cooperation between businesses, linking up to universities, I think this can be developed and delivered and hit the water, like I say, in five to ten years. According to a recent survey from Standard Chartered, most of the global private sector seems to be supporting some sort of carbon levy. Where does UK Chamber of Shipping stand on that? Well, we're working very close to the International Chamber of Shipping that's going to make a proposal for a, a, an international carbon levy. The issue with levies is not so much what they do, which is essentially to make the cost of fossil fuels um, similar and not much cheaper than um, new fuels, but the real issue is where that money goes. Uh, and we want to see that money return to the industry for research and development to accelerate that technology process um, so that we can become even better at what we do in, in steaming our ships around the world in a, in a carbon zero way. The shipping industry will find increasingly that there will be a strong link between what's good for the shipping company itself and its fleet and what's good for the wider environment. Singapore is the world's largest bunkering hub. The Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore is already planning for a decarbonised future, investing 120 million Singapore dollars to establish a global maritime decarbonisation centre. This collaborative initiative with industry stakeholders demonstrates how shipping and logistics can rise to the challenge of decarbonisation. Really, I think it's those companies who see this as a transformative moment, not a moment for small tweaks, but a moment to transform their businesses, to really embed sustainability and decarbonisation all the way through. And as part of that, I think we need to see companies transform the way they work together, because the only way to achieve decarbonisation is through collaboration and to really have a whole of supply chain solution. Tougher regulation will be required if we want to decarbonise, very simply, because voluntary action will only get you so far. And in the absence of regulation, no one's willing to pay the price that is required in order to decarbonise. What then do you think that the IMO needs to do to speed up the process? One of the key elements is actually research and development on alternative future fuels. This is key. Without that one, we cannot meet our target. That's why we're expediting our activities, the work regarding future fuels. So this is the most important element, but we need a certain like financial resources to do that. So I am always working on that element as well. That's the City of London where Multi-million pound deals are signed off every day for projects around the world, including, of course, in shipping. But the industry is facing huge challenges around transitioning to a decarbonised future, not only in terms of the technological changes, but crucially in terms of how to finance it. We have reached a tipping point. I think uh, the shipping industry as a whole, the shipping community, was slow to address these issues. I think suddenly uh, the climate crisis combined with the regulators uh, putting real pressure on shipping has now caused everybody to decide that this is the moment we need to get on and, and, and change the industry. But there is a problem. While major lenders like Citibank have signed up to the Poseidon principles, which aim to reduce the carbon intensity of shipping over time, at the moment the market is too fragmented for those principles to apply across the board. Yes, banks need to lend money to people to change the way that shipping is done, and they're willing to do so, but the repayment and credit metrics for that activity at the moment do not make sense. And so to make that make sense, we need to create new ways of wrapping that risk and to create incentives from regulators to help banks wrap that risk, whether it's a government-supported program, 
whether it is a regulatory allowance around certain kinds of credit metrics, but we need to find tools to help banks wrap that risk. I have days when I wake up and feel worried that, you know, do we actually have the commitment to do this? Um, because it does mean we need to take some risks, but the risks we take now are much, much less than the risks that we leave um, a really unlivable future to future generations. So, you know, we've got to be up for taking those risks. Not everything we try will work. We've got to be prepared to, to actually to invest money and fail fast uh, and pick ourselves up and, and move on and, and try new things. And unfortunately, I think some of our sort of machinery of government uh, are kind of some of our audit, some of the, the conservatism of the Treasury is not well geared up for that. And uh, we do need to get the, the finance and the investment um, really supporting the, uh, the changes that need to come. All wage and opportunity come along with the risk. But we have to see the, the optimistic side. We have to utilize these kind of development to help our the environment, help our industry as well. We have to be close to each other, have a more conversation and the collaboration toward our common target. New E-rating carbon reduction initiatives for existing vessels were a key feature of the latest amendments to the IMO's MARPOL regulations. Now, these amendments reaffirmed the IMO's knowledge-sharing approach and support for smaller states and island nations, those who could be hardest hit by the cost of new requirements, as well as climate change itself. The rating system is based on a ship's capacity to transport cargo and the fuel consumed in order to transport that cargo. In terms of uh, level of ambition, because we go by way of ambition, by 2030, we hope to cut it to 40% from shipping, transport work. And then by 2050, overall, we, we are looking at 70%. Uh, Critics regard the target set by the IMO as too low and too slow. But implementing such widespread changes while ensuring that no one is left behind cannot be done instantly. I think it is fair to say that we're behind schedule when it comes to the global transition towards zero emission shipping. Far behind. But now we are speeding up and the momentum is now growing. We need to ensure that all parts of the world can take part in the global transition towards zero emission shipping, developed and developing countries. Over the last decade, shipping has made huge strides towards a decarbonized future. For industry leaders, the question now is how best to build on the progress made and to quickly scale up viable solutions. There's lots of uh, determination a real excitement around supporting the industry through this so-called fourth propulsion revolution. And at Lloyd's Register, what we are now really focused on is ensuring how we make that a reality before the end of this decade. To achieve the industry's ambitious objective will require 10 years of intense action, greater cross-sector and industry collaboration, and for national governments to keep pace with the progress already made by the private sector. We want to hear critical uh, and clear, decisive uh, investment, investment in the land-based infrastructure, and give the private sector the confidence that, that the land-based infrastructure, which is more national in, in terms of its uh, investment, is moving at the same pace as shipping. So Nick, I'm going to put you in a room at COP26 with all the policy makers. What are you going to demand of them? I'm going to say we can make 5% of zero emission shipping, possibly more, absolutely achievable by 2030. But the worst thing that could happen is that five or more percent of the world ships are capable of running on zero emission fuels and we arrive in key ports around the world to deliver the goods that society in the nations in that room that I'll be speaking to are reliant on and there's zero, no zero emission fuels available for the ship to load. That's the scenario we need to work together on to avoid. The scale of this challenge is clear, but the answers and solutions are within our grasp. Thank you for watching.